Hi guys, good afternoon once again and welcome to another screencast in Immunology and Serology. I am Dr. Supache Basi, your lecturer for this particular screencast, particularly on the topic of precipitation and agglutination reaction. So for this chapter, we shall be discussing the basic um, fact regarding antigen and antibody binding. And of course, as a foundation for this particular topic, um, it is also very important that we'll be able to discuss, to discuss the precipitation curve, light scattering techniques, passive immunodeficient techniques, electrophoretic techniques, agglutination reactions, some of the pertinent instrumentation techniques that may be utilized for agglutination and precipitation, quality control and quality assurance. Now, at the end of the chapter, I know that complement fixation and neutralization is actually not part of agglutination and precipitation reaction. But since I'd like to touch on the serological reactions, um, I might introduce um, neutralization and, and complement fixation at the end of the chapter. Okay, so let us discuss first um, some of the terms that will be useful as a foundation in order for us to understand the principle of serological reactions. Okay, so what do we mean by the term affinity? Okay, affinity and another term that is actually more associated with this one is avidity. So, affinity is the initial attraction force between the FAB, so again, fragment for antigen binding, okay, so, it is the initial attraction force between F FAB site on an antibody molecule and an epitope. So, when we say epitope, it is the site of antigenic determinant and of course, epitope is found on the surface of the bacterial cell. So, not only on the surface of the bacterial cell, so when we say epitope, it is generally found on the surface of the antigen. Now, what we are measuring in affinity is the actual strength of attraction, and this depends on the specificity of the antibody for a particular antigen. So the initial attra attraction or an initial force of attraction between the antibody and the antigen is called affinity. Okay. Now, affinity um, involves uh, FAB interaction and FAB interaction with that of the epitope. Now, the rule is the more the cross-reacting antigen resembles the original antigen, the stronger the band will be between the antigen and the binding site. So, which means that if, if um, the cross-reacting antigen resemble the original antigen even if they are not exactly the same or or exactly the same the band will still be stronger okay so that's the reason why in some cases serological reactions will also have cross reactivity and because of that cross reactivity we cannot expect that a certain serological reaction will be perfect and there's even a chance of us getting false positive reaction in some of the laboratory acids. Okay, so moving on, um, avidity on the other hand is considered to be as the sum of attractive forces between an antigen and an antibody that keeps the molecules together. So which means that it involves the strength with which a multivalent antibody binds with a multivalent antigen. So, avidity is actually much. Uh, avidity does not does not only measure the the affinity, but the overall strength of a multivalent antibody with a multivalent antigen. So, the question is, what makes an antibody multivalent? Um, the antibody is a multivalent structure uh, because of more than one FAB portion. So, for example, a monomer would have two FAB, a pentamer has 10 FAB. 
um, an antigen may also be considered with as multivalent because of the several binding sites. Because on the surface of the antigen, there are several epitopes. Okay, so avidity therefore is the measurement of the overall stability of an antigen and antibody complex. So the antigen and antibody binding follows the so-called the law of mass action. In the law of mass action, okay, K refers to the equilibrium constant. Okay, so it means that free reactants are in equilibrium with bound reactants. Okay, so when you say free reactants, those those um, antibody or antigen that hasn't that has not or that have not bound yet, okay, or I mean that have not uh, bound yet, of course, uh, with each other, they're still free. So once um, they have actually found the specific receptor, let's say, for example, a specific receptor of FAB to that of the epitope because they follow the so-called lock and key theory. So once they have actually bound with each other, okay, so that particular binding, okay, the value of K depends on the strength of binding between the antibody and antigen. So which means that if we're going to look at this equation, the larger the amount of antigen and antibody complex, the more visible or easily detectable the reaction. Which means if the value of K is higher, then most probably you'll be able to see the reaction or reaction can be detected. Which means that if either of the antigen or the antibody becomes very low in amount, then you'll not be able to see any visible uh you'll not be able to see any detectable reaction at all. So the chances of you getting false negative reaction will be very imminent. So let us now discuss um, the serological reactions. Actually, there are four types of serological reactions. So this involves precipitation reactions, agglutination reactions, neutralization reactions, and complement fixation. However, for this particular chapter, um, this chapter is mainly focused on precipitation and agglutination reactions. So the key word here in the first bullet is the term soluble. Okay? Because when we say precipitation reaction, precipitation reaction involves involves um, combining soluble um, antigen with soluble antibody. So soluble antigen in precipitation reaction is referred as um, precipitinogen and it is combined with a soluble antibody. So a soluble antibody is known as the precipitin. Okay? So that they will be able to produce an insoluble complex or insoluble complexes that becomes visible. So take note that precipitation reaction is best observed if done in a semi-solid medium. Okay, now, precipitation reaction would require antigen and antibody. Okay, and they should have multiple binding sites for one another. That way, they will be, will be able to achieve the avidity. And another thing is that there must be equal relative concentration of each other. So when we say equal relative concentration, we are trying to achieve the so-called zone of equivalence. Okay? So what do we mean by zone of equivalence? Okay. So when we say zone of equivalence, this is now the zone of equivalence. Okay? The number of multivalent sites of antigen. Remember, I told you that antigen may be considered as multivalent because of several epitopes. Antibodies may also be considered as multivalent because of several FAB portions. Okay? So, the number of multivalent sites of antigen and antibody are approximate, approximately equal. So, that's what we meant by the zone of equivalence. If the zone of equivalence is achieved, then there would be detectable precipitation reaction. Okay? Now, the one that you can see here, okay, on, my, on your left side, Okay. Um, this is what you call the pro-zone reaction. So, 
prozone reaction is the zone of excess antibody. Okay? The one that you can see on the right side, um, you call that post-zone reaction. Okay? So, post-zone reaction is the zone of excess antigen. Okay? So, pro-zone, excess antibody, post-zone, excess antigen. So, let's talk about pro-zone phenomenon. So, antibody excess. Okay? So, antigen combines with only one or two antibody molecules. Okay. By the way, um, this particular formation in the zone, zone of equivalence, um, we call it cross linkages. Okay. Or, or in some cases, or in some texts, they call it lattice formation. So that's the reason why the zone of equivalence follows the so-called lattice hypothesis. So it follows the so-called lattice hypothesis. Now. In prozone phenomenon, wherein you have too much antibody, no link, low cross linkages are formed. Therefore, prozone phenomenon uh, may result to false negative reaction. Okay, so prozone phenomenon may result to false negative reaction because no cross linkages are formed, and because of the high antibody concentration. So, if a false negative reaction is suspected due to false, due to prozone phenomenon, diluting out the antibody and performing the test again may produce a positive result. So, again, in prozone phenomenon, in order for us to prevent prozone phenomenon, we can do serial dilution of the serum. So, that way, we'll be able to prevent um, prozone phenomenon. Okay, post-zone phenomenon, on the other hand, is known as the zone of antigen excess. So here in the post-zone phenomenon, um, you'll, be able to, you'll be able to see small aggregates okay, are surrounded by excess antigen. Again, no cross-linkages, no lattice formation. Okay, so the presence of small amount of antibody may be obscured, causing false negative results. So, take note that both pro-zone phenomenon and post-zone phenomenon may result to false negative results. So, in order for us to prevent this, we have to repeat the test a week later with the specimen so that um, it will allow us to uh, give time for further production of antibodies. So, for example, um, a COVID patient has recently been exposed and you do the COVID rapid testing. So, no antibody yet. Then so you have to wait for several weeks before you can see a detectable result. If the test is negative again, then it is unlikely that the patient has the antibody. Now, in post-zone phenomenon, this may also be prevented by cell washing. For example, in in indirect blood typing, you cannot see uh, agglutination, then cell washing may be performed. Okay, so that's another way of, of preventing um, post-zone phenomenon. Okay, so these are the different uh, precipitation reaction techniques. So let's start with nephelometry. So nephelometry may be utilized for the assay of immunoglobulin, complement, acute phase reactants such as C-reactive proteins and other serum proteins. Sensitivity is is uh, it, 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 it is a, it can measure about one microgram, one to ten microgram AD per ml, antibody per ml. So what is the principle of nephelometry? Nephelometry is the exact description of turbidimetry. Um, because in nephelometry, light that is scattered at an angle is measured, indicating the amount of either antigen or antibody present. In turbidimetry, we are measuring the amount of light that is black. In nephelometry, we are measuring the amount of scattered light. Okay? And uh, then we also have Radial immunodiffusion. Radial immunodiffusion 
uh, may be utilized for for measurement of immunoglobulins and complement. And the sensitivity is between 10 to 50 micrograms antibody per ml. So here, the antigen is allowed to diffuse into a gel. So remember, the best way to demonstrate precipitation reaction is using a semi-solid medium such as gel. So the gel is infused with antibody. So here, since it is infused with antibody and you allow it to diffuse, we'll be measuring the radius. And the radius will indicate the concentration of the antigen. So the radius is directly proportional to the concentration of antigen. Now, Ashton Lonnie double diffusion technique okay, is another way of demonstrating precipitation reaction. So we can use this for the measurement of complex antigen such as the fungal antigens or the antigens of Cryptococcus neoformans. Sensitivity is between 20 to 200 and here both antigen and antibody will be diffused out from the wells and the lines of precipitate will form or will, will allow us to interpret the relationship between antigens and antibody. So we will be discussing this later on. By the way, um, I told you that uh, in precipitation reaction, it is best demonstrated using semi-solid medium. So, precipitation reaction is best demonstrated using semi-solid medium. And you'll be able to know if precipitation has already taken place by the presence of the precipitin line. So, if you'll be able to see a whitish cloud line, a whitish clou uh, um, cloudy line in the gel, and that indicates precipitin line. Okay, so another one is immunoelectrophoresis. Um, it is used to differentiate several kinds of serum proteins, and the sensitivity is between 20 to 200. So when you say electrophoresis, um, electrophoresis is actually the migration of proteins in an electrically charged field. Okay, now since antibodies are made up of gamma globulin, and gamma globulin is also a protein, then it is possible to do it. Okay, so electrophoresis of serum is followed by diffusion of antibody from the wells. And then, another technique that is very much related to immunoelectrophoresis is immunofixation electrophoresis. Here, we'll be able to interpret whether there has been an over or underproduction of an antibody. Although in this technique, the sensitivity may vary. So, here, electrophoresis of serum is followed by direct application of antibody to the gel. Okay, so let's discuss them in detail. So, first we have radial immunodiffusion. Okay, radial immunodiffusion is a single technique. So, antibody is in the support gel and the antibody is applied in a well. Okay? Cut in the gel. Okay? So, antibody is already in the gel. Then the antigen is applied. Okay? So, you have, since it's a gel, it can easily be cut and then you apply antigen. So, it is also used for the measurement of measurement of uh, C3. So, there are actually two ways of doing it. You can either do it using the endpoint method and the other one is the kinetic method. Okay. So, the square of the diameter is proportional to the antigen concentration. The Fahey method is also known as the kinetic method and the Mancini method is also known as the endpoint diffusion technique. Okay. In the Fahey or kinetic method, um, the diameter is measured at 18 hours. Okay, so the lag of the concentration of the standard is proportional to the precipitin ring. So after 18 hours, you measure, you measure now the diameter. Unlike in Mancini method, in Mancini method, um, the antigen is allowed to diffuse maximally. So there is no time limit. So however, it depends on what you are trying to analyze. So for example, you're trying to analyze IgG or antibodies made up of IgG, it will only take 24 hours. But if it's IgM, it may take between 52 to 72 hours. 
Okay, so that's the Mancini method. For diffusion, you may also get, or you may also uh, do a calibration curve. Okay, if you know the concentration of your standard. Okay, so by the way, when you say standard, standard is a substance of known concentration. So what you're going to do here, so you have here three standards. And for example, standard one, uh, standard one has a concentration, okay, uh, let's say 7, and then standard 2 is 16, and then standard 3 is 21, for example, and then you get the diameter, okay? So the diameter, so let's say the diameter for standard 1 is, the standard 1 is, um, let's say the diameter here is mm, 5, standard 2, the diameter is 17, Standard 3, the diameter is 19. So you plot it and make a straight line here. So this is the best fit line. So let's say your unknown has a standard, has a diameter of 14 or 13. Therefore, you can plot your, you can plot your, uh, you can plot here your unknown. And then down here, so most likely, the concentration of your unknown is 11 milligrams per deciliter. Okay? So, another, so that's the radial diffusion. So, another example of, of precipitation reaction is the outer lonely diffusion. So, outer lonely diffusion is a double diffusion technique. So, here, Wells are cut in a gel and both antigen and antibody will be allowed to diffuse radially. So you'll be able to uh, see precipitin line after the antigen and antibody have met. So there are three possible patterns. So there are three possible interpretations as well. So these are identity, partial identity, and non-identity. So this is an example of serological identity. So there is a semi-arc formation. So this particular semi-arc formation is known as serological identity. It means that the antibodies here, I ident are ident the antibody here is identical to both antigens on to the antigens found in both wells. This is an example of non-identity. So when you say non-identity, the antibody is neither identical to well number one nor to well number two okay so this one is partial identity so when you say partial identity the antibody here is identical to only one of the antigens so here you'll be able to see spore formation so if there is a spore formation so it means that if there is a spore formation then it means that um, only one of the antigens is identical okay so moving on let's discuss now um immunofixation electrophoresis so immunofixation electrophoresis electrophoresis is an example of double diffusion technique so here we allow an unknown antigen so when you say an unknown it could be coming from the patient or the substance of your interest so an unknown antigen is allowed to electrophoresis and the antibody is then applied directly to the gel. So you have an antigen which you allow to electrophoresis plus the antibody is actually found in the gel as well. So the precipitate form wherein the antigen and antibody combination has met. So the antigen and antibody complex combination has actually taken place in the gel. So the technique is used with serum as the antigen to determine over or under production of antibody types okay so you'll be able to see um, the the serum of the patient um, let's say for example this is a standard and in this patient um, the G may, which may refer to IgG or the gamma the gamma chain is actually dominant so there's a so you know the electro the, the gel the gel electrophoresis may be stained and the more intense the stain, it indicates that there is 
um, overproduction of a particular protein. If it's if the stain is very light, then it indicates um, indicates underproduction. So, by the way, proteins migrate in an electrically charged field. So that's the basic principle of electrophoresis. Now, take note that the the rate of migration, or I mean, the speed of migration, uh, is actually dependent on the molecular weight. So, gamma chain is actually much is actually much uh, lighter as compared to the mu chain of the IgM. So that's the reason why gamma chain uh, migrates farther, further as compared to the mu chain. So here you can see that there is an overproduction of the gamma chain as compared to the standard. And then the lambda chain is also over, overly produced as compared to the standard. And then move on to another type of serological reaction. And this time we'll talk about um, agglutination reaction. So, agglutination is the visible aggregation of particles resulting in a combination, resulting from combination with specific antibody. Okay, now take note, the key word in agglutination is, is aggregation between particulate antigen and a particulate antibody. And like precipitation, precipitation reaction involves soluble antigen and soluble antibody. So, it is a two-step process because the first step is known as sensitization. So, when we say sensitization, sensitization is the initial binding. So, the antigen and antibody is introduced for the first time. So, they unite by means of or through the antigenic determinant sites. And then, after sensitization, the next step is lattice formation. Okay, so lattice formation is the formation of large aggregates. So there would be rearrangement of antigen and antibody bonds to form a stable lattice. Okay, so lattice formation, if, it's, if this one is formed, it means that there is already a zone of equivalence. Just like your precipitation reaction, Prozone phenomenon, pozone phenomenon will result to false negative reaction. Okay, so here, this is an antibody, and the antibody that is involved in agglutination reaction, we call it agglutinin, and then this would be the antigen with several binding sites. Okay, so the FAB portion will bind at the epitope, so the epitope, so this one is introduced for the first time. This is sensitization. So take note that sensitization is still reversible. Unlike if there is already a lattice formation, it means that there is already a visible agglutination, then it becomes irreversible. Okay? So there are several types of agglutination reaction. So we have direct agglutination. In direct agglutination, this utilizes um, bacterial antigen to test for the presence of unknown antibodies in the patient. One of the most common examples of agglutination reaction is the Widal test. Okay, uh, Widal test utilizes Salmonella O and H antigen. So O refers uh, refers to somatic antigen. The antigen comes from the cell wall. And the H refers to flagellar antigen because the antigen came, uh, the antigen ca came from the flagella. So O, uh, actually the reason why it is O, um, uh, it actually uh, it actually means on, uh, on hunch, on hunch. Okay, so. And uh, the flagellar antigen is the H antigen, which will result to the Honch phenomenon. Okay, um, O agglutination with O antigen results to compact agglutination. Agglutination with H antigen results to fluffy agglutination. So without test, therefore, uh, there, uh, uh, by the way, is a rapid screening test to determine the possibility of you having typhoid fever. Although nowadays. Without test, it's already considered as passe 
because there are now more um, reliable tests for typhoid fever, such as the Typhidat test. Okay, okay, that. Okay. Aside from aside from the Vidal test, we also have the Will Felix test. So Will Felix test is the serological test for typhus fever. Is it different from typhoid? Yes, because typhoid, the etiologic agent of typhus fever is, uh, is the rickettsia from the genus rickettsia. Okay, whereas typhoid fever, the etiologic agent is from the genus salmonella. Another form of direct agglutination is the blood typing, as, as you can see here. So, this type of agglutination reaction is known as hemagglutination because this involves RPC. We can find the antigen at the surface of the RPC. If you're type A, you have A antigen on, it, on, on the surface of the RPC. If you're type B, you'll have B antigen on the surface of the RPC. Okay? So... In agglutination reaction or in blood typing for that matter, you can either do it using the tube method or the slide method. Um, tube method is much actually better, but although slide method is easier to perform, because in the tube method we can actually we can actually centrifuge the tube so that you'll be able to grade the agglutination as to plus four down to plus three, plus two, plus one. And negative okay so this is quite useful especially if you're going to interpret um, broad spectrum compatibility testing in that vacuum okay now let's talk about other types of agglutination so we have the passive agglutination um, passive agglutination is also known as the indirect agglutination because unlike hemagglutination wherein the antigen is actually found on its surface Passive agglutination, in passive agglutination, you will have to, to utilize indicators. So the indicator serves or the indicator serves as the particles because in positive agglutination, uh, it employs particles that are coated with antigen not normally found on their surfaces. So you can use RBC, latex, gelatin, silicates, but in, in serology, the most commonly used indicator are the latex particles, okay? So, these indicators could either be made up of synthetic beads or particles because it provides consistency, uniformity, and stability. So, some, and nowadays, um, aside from the one that we've mentioned, um, gold nanoparticles are also being utilized, but it is actually not a type of agglutination reaction. In passive agglutination, um, this is also useful to detect uh, rheumatoid factors, antibodies to group A streptococcus antigen. So that particular test is known as the ASO or the anti streptolysing O. Antibodies to viruses such as rotavirus, cytomegalovirus, rubella, and varicella zoster vi virus. Antibodies to hepatitis virus and HIV. So the process is that since the antigen is not uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, the reason why we're using Arctic, uh, latex particle forgive me for that confusion is because again okay again antigens are not normally found under surfaces okay so you need an indicator okay so here the antigen is attached to a carrier particle agglutination occurs if patient antibody is present Okay. which is the exact opposite of reverse uh, passive agglutination. Okay, in reverse passive agglutination, it is used to detect microbial antibodies. Okay, so common application would be um, rapid identification of antigen from infectious agent. So here, you are trying to determine the presence of antigen. Okay, what is the difference? In passive agglutination, you're trying to determine if antibody is present. Here, in reverse passive agglutination, you're trying to determine if antigen is present, such as group B streptococcus, staphylococcus aureus, streptococcal group A and B, rotavirus, and cryptococcus neoformans. Therefore, 
uh, you have to use specimen that may contain soluble antigens such as urine, spinal fluid, or even serum. Spinal fluid particularly for Cryptococcus neoformans. Okay? So, the process is that Instead of, an, of the antigen being attached to the carrier particle, because that is the case of passive agglutination, here, an antibody is attached to the carrier particle. So, ag ag agglutination, of course, if antigen is present in patient sample. So, again, in passive agglutination, you are detecting antibodies. Antigen is attached to the carrier particle. In reverse passive agglutination, you are detecting antigen. So, antibody is attached to the carrier antigen. So, let's compare. So, here, okay, in, this is uh, figure A and this is figure B. So, here, the carrier particle is mixed with soluble antigen. So, if the soluble antigen has been admixed with the carrier particles, the carrier particles are now considered to be as coated. And then you add patient serum that may contain patient antibodies and agglutination occur. Okay, so this is the part of your reagent system. Okay, this is the part of your reagent system. However, the carrier particle this time contains antibodies as compared to the other one, this one contains antigen. Okay, this one, the carrier particles contain antibodies. So you're trying to detect antigen this time in patient sample. Just the same, if patient antigen is present, then there is an agglutination reaction. Okay, so let's talk about agglutination inhibition. Okay, so agglutination inhibition, uh, in order for you not to get confused, in agglutination inhibition, the presence of agglutination, it says here, the presence of agglutination, okay, means a negative result or a negative reaction. Absence or lack of agglutination is a positive result, okay, a positive reaction. So, it is based on competition between particulate and soluble antigen for limited antibody combining sites. So, agglutination inhibition is being used to detect antibodies to certain viruses such as rubella, mumps, measles, influenza, parainfluenza, hepatitis B virus, herpes virus, respiratory syncytial virus, and adenovirus. So, in this particular agglutination reaction, so let's say for example, you have scenario A again, and this is scenario B. Okay, so in scenario A, antigen is present from the patient sample. So you add now antibody. Okay, if the antigen is specific to the antibody, there would be immune complex. Again, when you say immune complex, it is a complex made up of antigen and antibody. Now, this part, this is, this is a part of the reagent system. You will now be adding antigen coated particle so this is a latex particle coated with antigen since the antibodies have already combined with the patient's antigen okay with the antigen coming from the patient sample so there is already a limited antibody binding site so you won't expect this latex particle to be able to bind with the antibody Therefore, there is no agglutination, and this is an example of a positive test. Okay, so which comes from the patient? This patient sample. Which comes from the reagent? Okay, reagent antibody. This is a reagent antibody, and this is the reagent containing latex particle, for example, coated with antigen. Okay. On scenario B, the patient doesn't have any antigen in his sample. So even if you'll be adding antibodies coming from the reagent, there is no immune complex. So the next time around that you'll be adding an antigen-coated particle, the antigen-coated particle will be combining with the reagent antibody. 
Therefore, there would be what? Agglutination. And agglutination reaction here is indicative of a negative test. Okay? So do not forget, okay, about agglutination inhibition. Okay? So there's another example of agglutination inhibition, but this time we'll talk about the viral hemagglutination inhibition. Okay? So, what does it detect? Okay? It may detect, um, it may detect patient antibodies. Okay? So, if you will be detecting, if, if for example, you are doing the viral hemagglutination inhibition, so your patient sample is a serum. If, so this is like an antibody testing. So, if the serum of the patient contains antibody and then you'll be adding viral antigen there would be immune complex even if you'll be adding rbc then rbc will not be agglutinated because the antigen okay antigens have already bound with the patient antibodies so rbc won't, ha won't have any agglutination at all so this is a viral hemagglutination inhibition it's only okay take note it's only applicable for viruses with hemagglutinin. So, what are examples of viruses with hemagglutinin in the envelope? So, that's the orthomyxovirus. Flu virus is an example of orthomyxovirus. Okay? So, let's say, take a look at result B. In result B, the patient doesn't have any antibody. A negative result. So, even if you'll be adding viral antigen, there won't be any immune complex. And since there's no immune complex, even if you'll be adding RBC here, then the antigen will bind with the RBC because hemagglutinin, hemagglutinin has the capacity to agglutinate RBC. So, these viruses here have hemagglutinin in the cell in the envelope okay so there's no immune complex therefore it will agglutinate rbc so do not forget hemagglutinins are found in the envelope in the viral envelope and they're capable of causing agglutination of rbc okay so let us now um compare the different types of agglutination reactions so if i were you um, i will screenshot this particular table and I hope that you'll be able to review them properly. Okay. So, there are several instruments that may be utilized to help you um, measure um, agglutination reactions. So, we call it the PASIA, the Particle Counting Amino Assay, which utilizes the principle of nephilometry. Remember, when you say nephilometry, it is the measurement of scattered light. So, it involves a laser in an optical particle counter to measure the number of residual non-agglutinating particle in specimen. So, we can actually measure exactly the extent of agglutination. Of course, if there's no agglutination, light will be scattered. Unlike if there's agglutination, agglutination light will be blue. So, you'll not be, be able to measure scattered light anymore. So, PASIA is useful for measuring serum proteins, therapeutic drugs, tumor markers, and certain viral antigens. So, for quality control and quality assurance, these are the reminders. Avoid cross-reactivity by using monoclonal antibodies directed against antigenic determinant unique to a particular antigen. So, if you remember the definition of monoclonal antibodies, monoclonal antibodies are antibodies produced by a single clone of T cells and that makes it highly specific then we have to store the reagents properly and check for its expiration dates so account for sensitivity and specificity of specific test kits being used and be aware that a negative result does not necessarily mean that you do not have the disease or the antigen just like in our rapid COVID-19 antibody testing Okay, so there you have it, uh, the summary. You may take a screenshot of the summary. Sorry, that was too fast. What? Okay. 
Okay? So, take the string shot again. <laughs> One, two, three, okay, four, five. And here's an example, by the way, of outster lobby technique. So, you can see here, identity, partial identity, non-identity. Uh huh. Yeah. I know. I think both of these are partial because it doesn't cross. The line didn't cross. Oh, by the way, this is an example of complement fixation test. So it's another example of another example of serological test. Again, uh, in complement fixation test, remember that the presence of hemolysis is a negative reaction the presence of uh, no hemolysis means it is a positive reaction okay now take note in complement fixation test there is an indicator system okay an indicator system so an indicator system is rbc rbc is one indicator system and then another indicator system is is Another indicator system is Schiff's RBC. Okay, so that's the indicator system. Okay, RBC. Okay, and or Schiff's RBC may be utilized. And another indicator system is is um, hemolysin. Okay, so what is a hemolysin? Hemolysin is an antibody that can lyse RBC. So again, indicator system Schiff's RBC. Hemolysin. Okay, so take note that in complement fixation test, you need to you need to um, inactivate the serum by heating it at 56 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes. That process is called heat inactivation, and the purpose of heat inactivation is to destroy native complement because the complement that you will be using here came from their agent. You do not want naturally occurring complement in patient serum to interfere with the results. Okay, so take note in scenario A. Scenario A, does the patient doesn't have any antigen. So even if you'll be adding antibodies, there is no immune complex. So even if you'll be adding complement as part of the reagent, there is no immune complex. So the next time that you'll be adding the indicator system, the indicator system, the complement here will bind at the epsi portion of the antibodies and this will cause lysis of the RBC. So this is a negative result. Here, it is an example of a positive result because the patient has an antigen. So if you will be adding antibody and complement, so these two are part of the reagents, huh? the antibody and the complement. So if you'll be adding them, so there is an immune complex. Here's the immune complex. So even if you'll be adding the indicator system, the complement has already the complement has already bound with the immune complex. Therefore, the RBC will be unharmed. So there's no hemolysis, and if there's no hemolysis, it's an in indicative of a positive reaction. So there you have it. Um, the different types of serological reactions. By the way. The fourth type is neutralization reaction. And neutralization reaction is most effective against viruses and toxins. So the principle of neutralization reaction is almost similar, similar to viral hemagglutination inhibition, wherein no agglutination is considered to be as a positive reaction. So always stay safe. God bless everyone. Bye!